Lovely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, firstly, I ask that you all uh, turn off your cameras and mute yourselves. We, uh, we are expecting quite a lot of attendees today, so this will help a lot with uh, conserving bandwidth. I'm Sarah Davidson, and I'm the Member Services Coordinator at Cabal in Melbourne, Victoria. I'm very pleased to introduce Ange Jenkins, who will say a few words of welcome and introduction. Ange is Coordinator Library Frontline Services at Federation University, and she's also the Chair of the Caval Customer Services and Collaboration Network. Thank you, Ange. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, firstly, on behalf of Caval and the CSCN, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands across Australia and New Zealand, where we live, learn and work. We acknowledge and celebrate the inherent strengths of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and communities and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and culture. We also acknowledge the people of these lands maintain knowledge through oral tradition practised for generations. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So I'd now like to welcome everyone to the first Community of Practice event in CSCN's online series Frontline Stories from a Pandemic. Usually our communities of practice events are face-to-face -face affairs with a smaller audience, but we are very happy this year to be offering these sessions to a larger audience in both Australia and New Zealand. Webinar etiquettes, as Sarah said, and further information about this session can be found through clicking on the links provided at the top of the chat. If you have any technical questions during the presentation, please type your question into the chat and the Caval team will assist you. This session will start off with a presentation, which is followed by a facilitated Q&A. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat and our facilitator will ask them in the Q&A segment. If you can place a queue before a question, this will assist the facilitator to distinguish between questions and comments. So Donna Wellman, coordinator of co-curricular services at La Trobe University Library is our facilitator today. And thank you very much, Donna. And now I am very pleased to introduce you to our presenters today, Claire O'Dwyer and Dana Perryman, both from Melbourne Polytechnic, where Claire is the library and learning skills manager and Dana is a senior campus librarian. Their presentation is about how the library and learning skills services have been operating during the COVID-19 pandemic. The TAFE perspective differs a bit from other higher education libraries, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to learning more about Claire and Dana's experiences. Thanks to you both, and over to you, Claire and Dana. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you, Kaval, for um, inviting us to speak. Dana and I are going to do a bit of an interview of each other, but just to set the stage, Melbourne Polytechnic has seven physical libraries and between 25,000 and 30,000 students. Um, it is dual sector, however, the majority of our students are on campus and in person and um, often have a lot of uh, unique uh, needs that we support. So I'm currently undertaking a PhD at RMIT University and part of my research methods unit that I'm studying, we were given a really great example of some qualitative research. And the article was, um, organisational mourning is a process um, towards a model of organisational mourning. And uh, this was published in 2019 in the Academy of Management Journal. And that might seem a bit strange to be looking at organisational mourning. This was an article in relation to Lehman Brothers, but as Dana and I have come out of quite a major change, as I'm sure many libraries have, we noticed that some of the trends and uh, phases of organisational model, um, organisational mourning, really apply to our own experience. The five stages of mourning include experiencing the death event, uh, remembering the organisation, assessing loss, salvaging, evaluating and rest, restoring and creating continuity and detaching from the event. So um, we're very happy to provide more details of this article, but I'm going to pose the first question to Dana. Dana, how did you feel when the um, incoming event of COVID-19 was approaching our Melbourne Polytechnic Library Service. 
Well, with experiencing the death event, there was certainly a lot of denial within the organisation. I don't think we really believed it was happening. Um, you have to remember that Frontline um, has been on site since March. We've had libraries open since March. Um, as of the beginning of July, we had all Frontline staff. Um, on site. So up until the day before, I don't think we really believed that we were going to close um, when stage four happened um, in the beginning of August. So within that denial, there was some denial within the organisation as well through um, leading up to stage four. We had to uh, push for additional cleaning um, within the libraries. We had to make sure our staff were safe with the Perspex screens on the front line. Um, we also had a bit of denial of the situation from external parties as well. We discovered as public libraries were closing, as tertiary institutes were closing their libraries, we had a lot of inquiries from members of the public and other students from other institutes who couldn't understand why they couldn't use our services as well. So there was a lot of stress um, dealing with that as well on the front line. I would say um, I think the first three stages um, happened very fast. Like we could see the tsunami of libraries closing. It was actually quite shocking to see the state library close and uh, everything closing very quickly in March. And we had to, we felt that even though our organisation was somehow in slight denial of what was happening around us, that we had to get ready because we could see what was happening in our industry. And so the first phase of like, quickly coming together, having an emergency meetings every day, um, updating the website. We were imagining that we were going to fully close. And I think when the state government declared that we were an essential service and we were not closing, that was sort of a, a, quite a surprise as well. And how would we manage staying open? We started the year with our seven libraries open, then it changed to three libraries, and then we reopened and we had five libraries. And then finally, um, on the, about the 4th of August, I was in a senior CEO meeting and they announced the library closing and I had to actually stop myself from bursting into tears. I actually really, really felt the loss. And even though it was sort of like an adrenaline rush to try and manage services week to week and remain open, um, the thought of closing was actually quite sad. And I think that's where I felt, I felt the mourning of the loss of our of our, the way we worked very, really strongly. Um, Dana, do you want to just talk about what do you think have been some of the um, interesting changes that surprised us and were quite good innovations as well? Absolutely. So traditionally, our student body have been quite slow to embrace our online resources and to engage with us through chat, through library, um, the library email. So we've found as we've been forced to move off site that our students have really embraced using our e-resources, have really embraced engaging with us through chat and through those methods. So that's been fantastic it's, as well. It's given our frontline staff an opportunity to work within other departments, to work with members from other departments on projects. Um, so there has been a lot of positives from um, our experience working from home. And hopefully we'll be able to continue with a lot of those positive experiences as well. I would say um, there was some really amazing shifts. Like we always count our visitor numbers in terms of visiting our digital um, destinations as well as our physical. And in fact, if we combine those numbers halfway through the year, we've actually had more engagement, which was quite a surprise. We've had um, staff working in project teams that they've never worked with before because we suddenly had this flexibility to enable staff to try new things. Um, we repositioned our Ask a Librarian chat into all the lib guides and that was all embedded into um, the learning management system. We got invited to the table to a lot of meetings that we would never be offered and we have taken over the learning management student support, the Moodle support, because the Moodle team was so overwhelmed. Um, and we've had a lot of say in things. I think, um, you know, we're, we're currently in the process of trying to plan for recovery and plan for reopening, um, trying to work out scenarios when there's still a lot of uncertainty and, you know, really um, holding our breath that we don't end up coming back and then closing again and, you know, that 
our state ends up in another um, stage four. But I have to say that the optimism, um, the humour, the optimism, the willingness to change, I think, saved us. And I also think that our, our library staff and learning skills had, were a really strong team anyway. And um, they've sort of, they've, they've pretty much been able to support each other in ways that are not necessarily formal. Um, I know that a lot of staff just catch up because they're just missing each other. And I think that's, that's what's been a bit hard is we have close relationships with our students and our staff in person and that loss and knowing that we will never ever be the same again has been, it's still hard to sort of really accept even though we know there's some great outcomes that have happened along the way as well. Donna, do you want to speak further around any of those aspects? Absolutely. I don't think you can underestimate the amount of loss people are experiencing at the moment. And we're not just talking about that organisational loss, the loss of your connection to the workplace, of the loss of, for the frontline staff, um, the, the structure, the role, what will my frontline position look like if I'm working from home? Um, the loss of control. We didn't want to shut our doors, but we had no choice. Mm -hmm. So as well as that organisational loss, People are going through so much personal loss at the moment, especially with stage four Melbourne. It's that loss of contact with family and friends, the loss of being able to go out um, and see the footy. The, I've had staff member postpone a wedding. I've had staff members attend virtual funerals. I think you can't um, dismiss just the sheer amount of loss and how people will react to it as well. Um, people will get angry, they will grieve, they may withdraw. I think especially as managers, you have to be very mindful of how staff will react to this situation that has no precedence as well. Absolutely. I think one of the wonderful things was even though we thought we should just shut down initially because we did feel scared, let's be honest, we were scared. We didn't know where this virus was going. But on the other side, we were an essential service and it was very reassuring that we were told from our CEO that because we were state government employees that our positions were pretty much guaranteed um, and that there was no fear that we would lose our positions. We were able to continue employing some of our casual staff um, and that sort of, it, it felt really good for our service to feel very, very important and very critical, even though at times staff were scared, they got angry. Some staff did not want to work from home. They really wanted to stay in the library. They wanted the doors to stay open. Personally, I think I was in constant denial, just saying, you know, um, this is short term, we'll be back, you know, and always sort of um, giving a Disney version of what was happening. But I think when the, the when the tally hit 750 or, you know, over 700 that week, that week was quite crushing and we had to just really hang on and keep going. We didn't really have any other choice. We haven't done click and collect. We haven't sent books home. But what's exciting is our students really transitioned into our online resources like almost immediately when the doors were finally shut. Um, but we are now getting murmurings um, that people want our spaces to open up. So we are planning, we think our libraries will be reopening end of October. Um, how the service will look, we're not entirely sure, but I know that we, we, we can only try our best and give it our best shot. Um, and continue to tell our success stories and provide the infographic that you're seeing. We send that into the board, into academic board and vet boards and we let them know students are engaging. We're still important to them and they are still very much important to us. I might leave it there because I think we've gone <laughs> slightly over time, but thank you again um, for allowing us to share this story very quickly with you. Uh, thank you both. That was um, so interesting. Um, that was um, a really different perspective. Um, and I, um, if you could put a link to that article you were discussing, that'd be great because that sounded really, really uh, interesting. Um, so there are some questions that have come up. Um, <clears throat> What was the feeling amongst staff and the students who remained on site when the library was open and yet many other libraries were closed? 
So I can answer that. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty um, amongst the staff and, and the students as well, because we had to make sure staff and students were safe. Uh, we had to make sure, staff had to have the confidence to um, make sure people were wearing their masks for social distancing. And we also, unfortunately, the, the library has always been perceived as a safe space and that tended to work against it. We found that as students and even teaching staff were coming into the library, they would tend to relax and we'd see those masks coming down and we'd see those groups getting a bit closer. So whilst it's wonderful that people saw the library as a safe space, we had to make sure the frontline staff were confident that we could go up and make sure people were wearing their masks and make sure that people were doing the social distancing. Um, we had a regular, made sure regular cleaning came through. Um, it was a very unsettling time. Absolutely. And it was hard, to be honest, turning people away, turning members of the public away, turning members of other tertiary institutions away when the libraries um, were closing. That was difficult as well. And I think we had some responses such as, I can't believe you're still open, you're still open and being quite relieved um, that they still had a library. Mm. Um, there's a few questions that are quite similar. Um, now, um, uh, but I'll go to this one first. What do you think was the reason for the combined increase in the service, service usage um, throughout the year? Uh, well, I think somehow um, it's sort of like the silver lining that when libraries were closing around us, um, when students absolutely had to use and teachers had to use our resources in order to go fully online. So 70% of our courses at Melbourne Polytechnic are now fully online at the moment. And I think only like 2% were in the past. So suddenly um, we were a really critical part of student success. Um, and their retention and having those learning resources and support services embedded um, in their new environment, which was pretty much online. So I think it was that shift, that radical shift that the whole organisation said, we thought that would be, you know, years in the making <laughs> and it was weeks in the making. So, uh, yeah, suddenly we rose to prominence. Um, and I'll just say um, about 18 months ago when I first came to Melbourne to Polytechnic, I had heads of finance saying, why do we need a library? Why can't they just use a public library? So we went from there. We went from zero to hero, is how I would describe it. Um, and that is such an interesting comment. What, what do you think about that situation made it clear to um, senior management about the importance of the library? Because I think of quite a few libraries have probably experienced that same sentiment. Um, so what do you think is the essence of what this situation has been able to make clear about the value of libraries? So I'm, I will just say in the lead up to COVID in the last 18 months, we've ran really big marketing campaigns um, and raised the profile of some of our services like Studiosity and um, our online content. So, and we had started to engage with executive one-on-one -on -one and consult with them. So we had started to build this, raise this profile quite high. Our instinct survey results were, it had improved. So suddenly we were a bit front of mind. So when the crisis hit um, and suddenly everything was going online, we had already warmed up the audience, if you like, but then they realised that they really needed us because they were moving everything online, all the curriculums online, um, a lot of support for students was needed online and we were a critical part of that story. So we did things like you could um, book a librarian, Zoom a librarian for digital literacy support, but we had started that in-person service before this. Our learning advisors did start a Zoom one-on-one -on -one sessions. I mean, literally overnight. Um, and suddenly we were there and they could see the engagement. We, we could see um, our data also through the learning management system as they repositioned us in. So, um, you know, if we were a product, we just got put on the sort of like the prime real estate, um, literally within days. And I can't say how much 
raising awareness of your service is really important. If they don't know, if they don't know what you do, um, you know, you can get left behind quite easily. Mm. Um, and another really good question. Um, how did you find or manage providing equity of resourcing for students in various varying situations? Um, well, we, we pretty much had our libraries open right up until the 4th of August. So we were always able to sort of manage that. I think what's difficult now is that we can't give any hard copy um, book collection to anyone. We are not on site um, and we do have students who need it. Um, and that's becoming an issue. And the way we're working around that is to provide an e-text and we're getting more budget. So basically the executive have said, we know that you've gone fully online. We'll give you more money for digital resources if you need it. And so suddenly we're getting money thrown at us. But, you know, I don't know if it's the solution, but it's, it's kind of like the best we can do at the moment. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I think that's a bit, possibly a bit rare to be having money yeah, <laughs> thrown at no. you at the moment. <laughs> Lucky you. Um, this is uh, my question, actually. Um, with the embracing of the um, online uh, resources and the engagement, do you have a sense that that's going to continue at that same level once face-to-face -face services resume? in whatever new normal might look like? I think, I think what it's opened up is just more choice for students and they're more confident making those choices. Um, look, to be honest, I really don't know what's good, what it's going to be on the other side. But I think once students have really engaged with Ask a Librarian Chat or some of the e-materials and they're more confident, maybe that will be a choice that they take up or maybe not. Um, we have a lot of applied areas in fine art where the books the hard copy books are really highly valued. So, um, I don't know, Dana, what do you think? I really hope it will continue at, at an some sort of increased rate, but traditionally we do have a lot of students who do like the print text, um, who do like having the hard copy books. I'm, I'm hoping it will um, stay at an elevated usage. I don't think it may be as high as it currently is. Um, but as, as Claire said, who knows what the future will bring? Who knows what it will look like? But I do know our students really like having that physical book in their hands. Mm -hmm. True. Um, and a follow-up question from Sarah. Um, have you had to implement new e-resources or electronic initiatives during the pan or due to the pandemic? Uh, yes. We are, um, we've purchased a few... We've purchased Canopy, we've um, upped our licensing for Standards Australia, um, we've upped the licensing for Ask a Librarian Chat, we're just buying what we need as the demand's coming and we're buying e-texts and a lot more e-books. So, um, and we were basically told as soon as this happened that, you know, if you need digital resources to give students access to what they need in, in their courses, then just go ahead. Um, we haven't been knocked back for anything, but we have sort of, we have paused our hard copy book purchasing at the moment and shifted, um, shifted online. Yep. Um, you spoke a lot about um, the dealing with loss and the feelings that staff now have to navigate. Have you created any particular initiatives in order to support your staff? Uh, in terms of um, mental health, for instance? I do know um, with the front line, we make sure we catch up every morning. Um, we actually made a morning catch up compulsory. Before we made it compulsory, we were finding that some frontline staff were disengaging and that was a concern. Um, we wanted to make sure that people were still engaging um, with us, with their friends, with their workplace. Um, so every morning we catch up and that can be to discuss work. It can be to have a bit of a chat. 
um, bit of show and tell. Not much as <laughs> we don't really have much show and tell at the moment, um, but it's just to make sure that people stay connected. We're very understanding if people want to take leave at this time as well. Um, I'm, we make it very clear to staff, if you log on in the morning and you don't think today is going to be a day, you, you can take leave. It is okay. Um, to be very understanding and to make sure staff know they can be easy on themselves. Don't be, don't be too hard. You don't have to log in at 8.30 in the morning and work solidly every second until 5. Um, it, you, just be easy on yourself. We all have to be easy on ourselves mm. in this situation. Um, so to really make sure that staff understand that. We also um, catch up one-on-one -on -one with staff because we're very aware that staff may want to bring up something. Um, they don't feel they can bring up in a group situation or a group meeting. So we make sure we're available for that. And we also make sure we make time for that as well. The other thing that we did, um, in, in certainly our HR encouraged us to have regular meetings um, and and set that structure up, which has been ongoing throughout this situation. But we also, initially as a senior manager, I thought we had 10 strategic projects to launch and I thought that would be just too much in this situation. But actually staff said, you know, please, can you please launch the projects? Because it enabled people to grab onto a task and work with people they don't normally work with. But to have a task and a focus and, and sort of move it into a future stage um, and give people some meaning in, and purpose in their day to day, and that 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 really did surprise me. And it's been quite successful. And we're we're keeping that momentum and reporting the projects. Um, they are all around business improvement and innovation, and some of them are moving faster than others. But it doesn't really matter because it's all about connection and staying connected. And I think that that was that's probably one of the most critical things in this situation for us. Is, is staying connected, as Dan was saying, and uh, having empathy and understanding is, um, you know, deeply valued. And to be honest, that's what our library and learning skills staff give to our students all the time. Um, but now they're turning it on each other, which is, you know, I don't think we could make it through if we didn't, to be honest. Mm, definitely. Um, I think that's most of the questions so far post it in the chat unless anyone's got some last minute wants to put in there now. Um, Thanks Donna we are close to time so unless yes. there's one quick last question we will wrap up. Nope that's it. <laughs> Great thank you everyone so thank you so much to the, sp the speakers and the facilitator today um, it's a fantastic presentation um, I really um, like the conversation about kindness, particularly, you know, you started off talking about that sense of loss that a lot of people have felt. It certainly resonated with me and it finished talking about how we can all be um, kind to ourselves. So thank you for that. I think that's a really important discussion. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who asked questions and attended today and made it such an engaging session. Um, I'd like to thank Caval and this and CSCN for organising the event and particularly Sarah at Caval for your wonderful organisational skills. Um, you can uh, feel free to contact the speakers if you have further questions um, and you can send an email to members at caval.edu.au and you'll be provided with their contact details. Um, I'd also like to mention that as a small token of thanks to the speakers and facilitator in this webinar, CSCN and Caval have arranged for native trees to be planted by a community group through the organisation 15 Trees. This year, a lot of their trees will be planted in areas affected by the bushfires earlier in 2020. And for anyone who is interested, you can find 15 Trees on social media. Um, they have quite an um, interesting Instagram feed. Um, so please let us know what you thought of this webinar by filling out the online survey which will be sent to you shortly. This will assist the CSCN committee in improving future events and webinars. Uh, finally, a reminder that our next Community of Practice event is held tomorrow from 2 until 30, uh, 2 .30 and Marnie, Sia and Melissa um, Plasek from La Trobe University Library will tell us how they transition to online only client services across five campuses. 
and we hope to see as many of you there as possible. And yeah, thank you again, everyone. Lovely to see you all.